Welcome to the Invite Health Podcast, where our degreed healthcare professionals are excited to offer you the most important health and wellness information you need to make informed choices about your health. You can learn more about the products discussed in each of these episodes and all that Invite Health has to offer at www.invitehealth.com slash podcast. First time customers can use promo code podcast at checkout for an additional 15% off your first purchase. Let's get started. Quite a few years ago, I did a radio show where I was talking about bladder health. And within that show, I was discussing that there are certain classes of drugs that people are commonly prescribed for overactive bladder um, or incontinence that can actually affect in a very negative way someone's cognition or memory over time. And in doing that radio show, I actually had a customer who followed up with me afterwards and said, you know, I've been on this medication for, for quite some time. And she was on the the medication that I had mentioned on the show, which was called Ditropan. And the Ditropan, she says, I've been taking this for probably 10 years now, and I actually do feel like my memory is struggling a bit, and I guess I just chalked it up to the aging process, and the generic name of Ditropan happens to be oxybutynin. And so in discussing this with her, she you know, spoke with her doctor and said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of concerned. I think that perhaps being on the Ditropan is affecting my, my memory. So she came off of the Ditropan, ended up going with more natural options, and within four months, she was really seeing a significant shift in terms of her overall cognitive function. So the reason why I want to talk about this is my mom had sent me a recent um, report that came out, and I it just kind of hit me that, you know, I haven't talked about this ever on a podcast. And it really is so important because there are so many medications out there that can affect someone's cognition. And many times people don't even correlate it. Well, first and foremost, they are usually completely unaware that that's even a potential side effect. And oftentimes their doctor is unaware of that too. So I want to talk about the different types of drugs or classes of drugs that we know can lead to a higher rate of cognitive decline and can even lead to dementia. And this is, to me, a very important topic because so many people are on prescribed medications. And when you look at some of the more commonly prescribed medications in this country and you say, oh my goodness, there's that many people taking that medication, yet that's one of the medications that's clearly linked to the declining um, cognition. So I wanted to to focus a bit of time on this because I do think that it's a very important topic. So I am Amanda Williams, MD, MPH, and let's get right to it. Let's talk about kind of the what I started with when I was doing a show that was focused on bladder health. And one of the most commonly prescribed medications that people are put on for an overactive bladder or for incontinence is oxybutynin. It also goes by the brand name of Ditropan. And we know that this is an anticholinergic medication. That's the uh, mechanism of action. So when we talk about, you know, mechanism of action of a drug, we have to think, like this is the way, these are the different areas within the body that it's actually impacting it. So when we look at things that are anticholinergic, what this actually means is it's blocking your cholinergic pathway. So it's anticholinergic. Well, why is this important? Because when we look at our cognition, we know that choline plays a huge part of this. So even when you look at the drugs that are prescribed for Alzheimer's disease, those are actually trying to enhance the cholinergic effect. And so you look at a drug that actually blocks that, and it would make sense. Okay, if we're blocking the choline, then we are blocking the ability for the brain to have that very important amino acid, which is then you know, transferred into a fatty acid. So hence we we go down this path. So the report that my mom had sent over to me, because she always finds different things and says, oh, I think that you may find this interesting. Um, 
And she knows that I, I look at a lot of different research every single day, but sometimes she comes across something that she says, you know what, maybe this is something you haven't seen in a while. And this actually just, it kind of brought back to my memory, you know, this is very, very important stuff. So this was a report out of the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, talking about different classes of drugs and how these drugs actually are linked to an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And they published this in the Journal of Neurology. And one of the main classes of drugs that they focused on was the anticholinergic drugs, which are utilized for dozens of different conditions. So certainly when we look at bladder health, we know that that's one area, but we also recognize that the anticholinergics can be used for many different conditions. So even uh, Parkinson's disease, for example, there's a lot of different drugs that fall into that class. And what they were looking at at the University of California, San Diego was the mechanism of action and recognizing that those anticholinergic drugs are depleting the brain's storage of acetylcholine. So without having acetylcholine, this primary neurotransmitter that is required for our ability to think, our ability to have memory, that if we're blocking that, well, then that's a major, major issue. Now, interestingly enough, oftentimes, the people who are prescribed these anticholinergic medications are already up there in age. And the metabolism of those anticholinergic drugs are certainly much different than if that were prescribed in someone in their 20s or 30s. So they were really, you know, kind of delving into this and examining that brain and cognitive effect of different anticholinergic medications and recognizing that, yeah, they need to to spend some more time kind of focusing in on this because you certainly don't want people to be on a medication that is creating more harm than it is good. So I always like to, you know, broaden this a little bit more and say, well, what other medications? Because, you know, we have the anticholinergics, um, which can encompass things that fall into the category of allergies, um, high blood pressure, as well as incontinence, as I mentioned. But also benzodiazepines. And benzodiazepines are one of the most commonly prescribed medications out there. So whether we're looking at something such as Alprazolam, also goes by the name of Xanax, um, if we are looking at, you know, lorazepam, any of those benzodiazepine medications, we certainly know are commonly prescribed for both anxiety as well as commonly prescribed to older folks as a sleep aid. So instead of giving someone, you know, Ambien, who's 80 years old, they give them Ativans. And Ativan is a benzodiazepine. So this is a, a big, big problem. And Harvard actually looked into this and they were looking at 3,500 men and women over the age of 65. The design of this study was really quite unique. What they did was they were looking at the participants over the 10 years prior to the study. So basically looking and saying, okay, what medications were they on? And then they tracked their health for the next seven years. Now, during that time, out of the 3,500 men and women, 800 of them developed dementia. Now, what they were really focusing in on was the different types of medication that these people were on. And they found that those who were prescribed and using anticholinergic drugs were more likely to develop dementia than those who did not. Now, really what was really quite alarming in this study was that the dementia risk increased along with the cumulative dose, meaning that when someone was taking an anticholinergic drug for the equivalent of roughly three years, they had a 54% increased risk for developing dementia. And you have to think of that just for a second and say, wow, how many people experience issues with blood pressure or um, have an issue with bladder health and they get put on one of these medications and they're on them for technically the rest of their lives, but yet every single year, it's doing more and more havoc on their memory. And so their families look at them saying, oh, well, they're just getting old and forgetful, not even realizing it's coming from the medication. Now, a team of researchers in France and Canada, they did a really interesting study 
looking at benzodiazepines and the increased risk of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Now, within this, they identified over 2,000 men and women over the age of 66 years old who had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Now, within this, they wanted to do kind of a drug matching system. So we have this group of folks who have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Now let's look at the different drugs that they had been prescribed during the five to six years leading up to their diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And they found that people who had been taking benzodiazepines for three consecutive months or less, had about the same dementia risk as those who had never taken one. But those who had taken benzodiazepines for three months or longer had a 32% greater risk of developing Alzheimer's. Now, what was really interesting was that once someone was on a benzodiazepine consistently over a six-month time period, they had an 84% greater risk. And that is frightening because we know that so many people are prescribed these things, such as diazepam, that's Valium, looking at Ativan, as I mentioned, that's lorazepam, looking at Alprazolam, which is Xanax, looking at Temazepam, that's Restoril. These are all really, really commonly prescribed medications in older adults. And I think that we need to be aware of these things. Um, for, for many people, they do not correlate this. They do not recognize. So you want to look at different drugs that we know have these anticholinergic properties, definitely the benzodiazepines. We can look at diphenhydramine, for example, which is Benadryl. We know that these are the types of drugs that can create memory loss. Yes, Benadryl. We know this. We know that things like Atarax, which is hydroxyzine, that also has been linked to it. Chlorophenheimermine, which is commonly used over-the-counter cold medicine. Now, if someone is taking this on a regular basis, then we have to recognize that we need to have alternatives. Now, when we look at the rate of prescribed drugs out there. And we look at the top prescribed medications throughout this country. And every single year, they, they put out a list of the top you know, 100 prescribed medications. I mean, Alprazolam is number nine, number nine in this country, which is Xanax. And there are over 27 million prescriptions written every single year for that drug. Now, how many people are on that? They have no idea that once they're on that drug for three months or longer, that they just increase their risk exponentially for the development of Alzheimer's disease. Many people are not aware of that. And it's not just limited to benzodiazepines and to the anticholinergic medications. We also know that SSRIs, the selective Serotonin reuptake inhibitors, those very commonly prescribed medications, are also linked to an increase of the development of dementia. Now, how many people over the age of 50 years old are prescribed not only a benzodiazepine, maybe for their anxiety or for sleep, but also an antidepressant? The Journal of Clinical Psychiatry back in 2016 looked at that. They looked at antidepressant treatment and the risk of dementia. Now, this was a population-based retrospective case-controlled study. And in this study, they found that dementia patients were more likely to have multiple issues such as diabetes, hypertension, stroke. So what does this mean? More exposure to many different medications that can create memory loss. But specifically, they were looking at the use of SSRIs those selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the most commonly prescribed antidepressants in this country. And they found a significant increased risk of the development of dementia. And this is areas where every single day in this country, people are going in and getting their prescriptions filled. The number four prescribed drug in this country is Zoloft which is an SSRI. We have 
the number 11 drug, an SSRI. That's Celexa or Cytolopram. Lexapro, a Cytolopram, the number 16 prescribed drug in this country. Fluoxetine, which is Prozac, the number 19 drug prescribed in this country. And not to drone on and on about this, but I think that this is really important that people understand this, that out of the top 40, 50 drugs that are prescribed each and every single year, millions and millions of prescriptions written for these drugs are commonly linked to the development of memory loss. Cholesterol-lowering medications, we know that that can do that because it's stripping the brain of cholesterol. So you're on a medication for your depression, your anxiety, and your high cholesterol. And then, you know, five years down the road, you just don't understand why you have a hard time remembering anything. But yet we never look at the medications. And this is why I wanted to talk about this today because it's so darn important So 20% of the body's cholesterol is found within the brain. And if we are taking a medication that is stripping that cholesterol, then that's going to be an issue because now we're impairing the connectivity within the brain. We can no longer facilitate proper memory, proper learning. And we know that the statin drugs do this which is why if someone's on a statin drug, they have to make sure that they're taking good healthy fats, omega-3 fatty acids, phosphatidylcholine to help with that production of acetylcholine. All of these different things that we know, and certainly we know that the sleep aids can do it, you know, the different drugs such as Ambien, Lunesta. Clearly, these are all drugs that we are aware of. So anti-anxiety, cholesterol-lowering drugs, antidepressants, sleep aids are all drugs that are commonly known to create significant havoc when it comes to our cognition, when it comes to our memory. And if we don't do anything about it and we're not aware of this, and you may have you know, a grandparent, a close friend of the family, who every time you see me, gosh, their, their memory's a little off. Maybe instead of just thinking that they're slipping because of their age, maybe it'd be wise to ask them, hey, what medications are you on? And you may find, oh my goodness, they're on two or three different medications that are basically zapping their brain's ability to function properly. And maybe at that point in time, they can go in and speak to their physician, see if there are different alternatives. Because memory loss is one of the most dreaded conditions that someone can deal with. And initially, the person who's experiencing it tries to make excuses for it. But it starts to lead to that wear and tear of your everyday life. And this is all things that can be addressed and corrected And so I'm glad that my mom sent me over this because this is something that I've known for many years. I've talked about it, like I said before, on radio shows, but I think it needs to be talked about more often because when we look at those top 40 prescribed medications in this country and we recognize that out of that, there are so many of them that are on the list of drugs that create memory loss, we should be doing better not only as a health community, but we should be doing better for the people who are on these medications so that they don't have to succumb to memory loss, leading to dementia and potentially Alzheimer's disease. So that is all that I have for you for today. I want to thank you so much for tuning in to the Invite Health Podcast. Remember, you can find all of our episodes for free wherever you listen to podcasts or by visiting invitehealth.com slash podcast. Make sure you subscribe and you leave us a review. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Invite Health. And we will see you next time for another episode of the Invite Health Podcast.